In this segment, we're going to be talking about load calculation. The good news is the process of calculating the load in an indoor pool really isn't a whole bunch different than what you're used to doing for a traditional room. The big difference is, though, uh, the operating temperature. A pool is minimum 10 to 15 degrees warmer than you're used to dealing with, so you get to factor that in when you're doing your calculations. When we're doing our heating calculation, perfectly straightforward calculation, you're using whatever software that you normally do to calculate the heating load. The one thing you want to do, though, is make sure you've accounted for the outside air. In a northern application especially, the outside air could be 50% of your heating requirement. That's not something you want to overlook. Very, very critical. From a cooling standpoint, a lot of people think, well, I don't really want to do air conditioning on a pool, and it's not really something that you want to do, correct. But if we don't do something to keep the room temperature under control in the summer, it's going to overheat and be uncomfortable for your customers. So you're always going to want some degree of sensible cooling uh, capabilities in your facility. So depending on the type of system you're using, uh, you're going to be able to get that as a byproduct of the dehumidification process or you might have to consider a dedicated air conditioning system in your facility, again, depending on uh, the type of system you're using. The uh, latent load calculation, obviously, is where we focus a lot of our attention when we're designing an indoor pool. The uh, sources of moisture essentially are three, three sources. Um, the evaporation rate from the pool, spectators if we have any, and then, of course, the outside air. Geographically, that has a pretty significant impact on the facility. Now, when we're talking about the evaporation rate calculation, here again, this is why it was so important to have this dialogue with the customer. So we've established the type of pool they've got and the operating conditions they want to use. Now we can go to the ASHRAE handbook and pull out the formula number two and uh, do the calculations and figure out how much evaporation we're going to get. Um, Side note is, luckily for you, is a lot of these calculations you don't have to do manually. There's software available uh, that helps you along the way, keeps you out of trouble, flags you with uh, some of the recommended operating conditions and things like that. So, again, you don't have to do these calculations manually, but it's important to know the formula and understand what's required because it gives you a better feel for how water evaporates and why it does. The evaporation rate formula is actually fairly straightforward. We have a constant of 0.01 times the surface area. We need to know the square footage of the water. Water evaporates per square foot. We need to know the vapor pressure differential between the room dew point and the water surface area. So that's why it's important for us to establish those operating conditions up front. And then the final piece of the puzzle is the activity factor. This is a factor uh, where we basically find out how busy the pool is going to get. One thing that's a little different about pools is you never have a situation where there's no load. The pool always has a minimum evaporation rate when the body of water is flat at rest still. And then on top of that, that's our baseline. Depending on how busy the pool gets, we have to use that activity factor to establish how agitated the water is going to get and how much increase we're going to get in the evaporation from there. In the formula, there's a constant of 0.1. I want to talk about this for a second because it's important for you to be aware that constant factors in an air velocity on the water surface up to 30 feet per minute. One of the things folks used to do back in the day is they were worried about having any air movement at all on the water surface, so they tried to avoid at all costs any airflow on the water. The problem with that is that if you have no airflow at all on the water, you get some chemical buildup on the water surface and that's where the swimmers are breathing. So you get this, you get a higher chemical concentration there. So it is actually desirable to have some airflow on the water surface and kind of move those chemicals away so you get a better air quality right at the water surface. The problem in the past was folks said, well, if I get air movement on the water surface, I'm going to increase my evaporation rate. Well, if you start blowing ripples on the water, yeah, you're going to start increasing your evaporation, but the factor 0 0.01 includes an air velocity up to 30 feet per minute. So you can actually move a fair amount of air on the water surface without impacting the evaporation rate at all. So that is not something to worry about. Airflow on the water is actually desirable. The latent load calculations can get fairly involved, especially if you're dealing with multiple bodies of water, different activity levels, water parks, very complicated to calculate. 
The good news for you is, is you've got a lot of resources available for you out there. Uh, there's folks like us that do this all day, every day. And uh, if you work with us, you'll have the peace of mind knowing that somebody that does this all the time has asked you some questions and assisted you on the load calculations. And you really have a strong level of comfort that the values that you've calculated are accurate and, and really what you're going to be seeing in the field. When we're calculating our latent load, outside air is, is an important factor. Uh, geographically, it's going to have an impact on the facility. Uh, a pool in Houston, for example, is going to have a pretty significant outside air load, uh, whereas a pool in Denver, the outside air most likely is going to be a credit all year. So these are things we need to be aware of and we need to just know uh, that our outside air impacts our facility and has to be factored in when we're calculating the loads. Additionally, uh, spectators, depending on the type of pool you have, you may or may not have a spectator gallery. You can imagine 2,000 people sitting side by side in, in a fairly compact area are going to give off some moisture. Uh, that needs to be addressed uh, when we're doing our load calculations. So um, again, we need to look at the pool itself and see if there are going to be people sitting around because there are going to be a bit of a latent load from the spectators. We normally don't consider spectators in our load calculations unless we've actually got a pool with a spectator seating gallery. And if you do have a facility like that, um, that's a game changer. Basically what we need to do is we need to evaluate the pool in two completely distinct operating modes. One of them, which is going to be the lion's share of the year, is normal operating mode. That's going to be when the pool is used for the daily use. And next is when the swim meets are occurring. Oftentimes the operating conditions of a swim meet, water side and air side, are slightly different. So it's important when we're calculating the two that we've modeled them both and established the needs to satisfy each requirement so that we can deliver each individual requirement when they're needed. When we're doing our load calculation for a facility that hosts swim meets, we need to know how many spectators are going to be because, as we've discussed already, bodies give off a little bit of latent heat. If you've got 2,000 of them, all of a sudden the numbers get pretty interesting. In addition to that, we also need to know how many competitors are going to be down at the deck area. It's not all that uncommon on a very large swim meet to have a thousand swimmers on the deck. So again, that's a number we need to be aware of because these all have to be factored in to the load calculation. Very, very important to ask that from the owner, find out exactly what's going to be happening during a swim meet so we can model that properly. The next thing we want to discuss is the spectator seating gallery. Most facilities have the spectator seating gallery a little bit off to the side and um, sort of lends itself nicely to maybe creating a microclimate for them. Uh, people dressed up, long sleeve shirts and pants, really aren't going to be comfortable in a space that's 82 degrees, 50 to 60 percent relative humidity. So it might be something to consider to create a little bit of a microclimate for those folks in the spectator gallery, deliver a little bit more airflow in there, and maybe uh, get the air temperature down to 78 degrees or something like that. So that's a very nice uh, way to sort of create a more comfortable environment for the customers, uh, for the spectators. So from a design standpoint, it might actually make sense to have a separate dedicated air handler for the spectator gallery. Again, these are all budget issues but definitely something to consider because of 2,000 people, you want to make sure that they're comfortable during the swim meet.